Hello, my name is Mike Lawler. I'm a professor of pathology at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I've been asked uh, by Cure Rare Disease to provide a, a presentation to the DMD and muscle disease community about uh, how Western blotting and immunostaining is done uh, to evaluate for dystrophin expression in DMD. Uh, I work with a lot of pharmaceutical companies, so I have a lot of disclosures, which are listed here. And so really the topic of our talk today is about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but a lot of the principles can apply to um, a number of uh, disorders that are deficiencies of specific proteins. In uh, DMD, the disease is caused by a deficiency of dystrophin. And so that's due to mutations in the, the DMD gene. And what happens in DMD is that uh, you have essentially absent or very, very deficient dystrophin. That means that the dystrophin that's usually holding together uh, the, the intracellular cytoskeleton which in, within the muscle that uh, contracts to the uh, sarcolemma, which is the muscle membrane, and then uh, the basal lamina, which is kind of the supporting environment outside of uh, the cells. You know, in most cases, or in, in the presence of dystrophin, I should say, there is a uh, complex, a dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex that allows all of these elements to be uh, connected together. And so that way, when the inside components, the contractile apparatus of the muscle fiber contract, uh, the membrane and the connective tissue on the outside gets carried with it, and then there's not a shear force associated with the movement. In the absence of dystrophin, this, this um, complex doesn't form appropriately and there's no stabilization. And so what can happen is that the intracellular components can move before the membrane and the extracellular components, and the shear force can uh, produce muscle damage, and that's thought to be a major component of how muscle damage occurs uh, in DMD. What that causes on a pathological perspective, so this is what I deal with because I'm a pathologist, so I get tissue uh, from patients or from animals that gets cut and stained, and then I look at uh, what the structural abnormalities are. And you can see that in a normal muscle without DMD or significant structural problems, you have all of these muscle fibers, and uh, they're closely packed together. There's not a lot between them. Uh, the red areas are where the contractile apparatus is, uh, as well as a lot of the other cellular machinery. The purple dots are the nuclei, which in healthy muscle are um, usually located at the periphery of the fibers. And then what you can see here is that all of these muscle fibers are really well aligned with each other. There's not a lot uh, interfering in between them. And so when they contract, they move the whole muscle uh, in, a, in a strong and uh, pretty efficient manner. In DMD, what happens is as a result of the dystrophin deficiency and the damage that uh, the shear forces on the membrane uh, pr produces, there are repetitive rounds of fibers undergoing degeneration and regeneration. And so this degenerative and regenerative process uh, is consistently going on, and that's why uh, patients have elevated indicators of muscle damage. And over time, the muscle fibers themselves don't regenerate appropriately, and there's an increased amount of fibrous tissue, which is this light pink stuff here, and fatty tissue, which is uh, this clear stuff uh, in between the muscle fibers. And so in general, the muscle gets less and less and less healthy. There's less and less contractile elements uh, within the muscle tissue itself. And that's a significant problem. When diagnosing DMD pathologically, you uh, can look for a couple of key abnormalities. One is the presence of muscle fiber degeneration. And so you can see some muscle fibers falling apart and uh, being invaded by inflammatory cells that uh, help clean up the uh, degeneration. You also have evidence of recent regeneration, so things that uh, cells that are recovering, either um, being rebuilt from proliferating satellite cells or just recovering from injury. Those tend to look like these cells here. They have internalized nuclei and they're a little bit bluer in color, so sometimes they're called basophilic fibers. And then you have uh, cells that may not have been previously damaged, 
or that were previously damaged and that regrew. And so what you can see here is a variety of much redder fibers that look more like the color of what we were looking at in the normal. But uh, many of them have internalized nuclei, which is a regenerative feature. And you can see the fiber size is all over the place now, which is also uh, an element of uh, the regenerative process where the fiber size may not reach the original fiber size. And so overall, when you're looking at DMD, you see evidence of injury. It's, it's heterogeneous in where it's occurring within the muscle, so it's not all in one spot. And it's heterogeneous with respect to when it's occurred in the muscle. And so you have some new injury, you have some old injury, uh, you have some rapidly, you know, evolving injury into recent regeneration. Uh, and there's and there's not a lot of uh, disease states that do that in muscle outside of dystrophic disease states where the muscle is kind of pulling itself apart uh, randomly. Uh, the other thing you can do to look for um, whether or not this is, for instance, DMD versus one of the, the limb girdle muscular dystrophies is immunostaining. And so the immunostaining, as we'll discuss in a few slides, uses specific antibodies to detect where proteins are. And so uh, if you know what the normal distribution of a certain protein is, for instance, spectrin and dystrophin are at the muscle membranes, um, and eutrophin normally is not at the muscle membrane, it's um, on nerves and, and blood vessels, you can look at the muscle and survey it and then say all the proteins are where they're supposed to be. In DMD, uh, you can use the same types of indicators to say, well, eutrophin is being expressed at the membrane where it's not supposed to be, and uh, that happens in DMD and in some other uh, muscle disorders. Spectrin's supposed to be present and it still is and yet you can see there's very few fibers that are positive for dystrophin and so this is the kind of th kind of thing you can do diagnostically to say okay on H and E staining which is this red and blue staining you have something that looks like muscular dystrophy and then on immuno staining um, you can't detect dystrophin and uh, so that goes along with uh, DMD and then of course this can be genetically confirmed. Um, so with that bit of background, I'm going to talk about how we leverage this kind of diagnostic approach uh, to get more information about the different patterns that dystrophin expression can, uh, can take and, and what that means and, uh, and how that's kind of more useful now that uh, there are more treatments being developed. One other thing to note is that it's not necessarily just an all or none situation. Um, there are other situations like being a carrier or having Becker muscular dystrophy where you can use the same types of diagnostic approach uh, to, be, uh, to help answer questions. In the cases of DMD carriers, so these would be um, women who harbor one DMD mutation, but their other X chromosome has the, the normal dystrophin gene. What can happen is um, they can have little patches of the muscle that are dystrophin deficient and they can undergo degeneration in those patches, but then other areas uh, will have uh, appropriate dystrophin and won't necessarily degenerate. And so you can see little foci here of degeneration and you can see patches of dystrophin deficiency here. Um, and that's what a carrier can look like. In Becker muscular dystrophy, there are, are a lot of a lot of different types of problems get um, put into the Becker muscular dystrophy category. Clinically, it's basically a dystrophin deficiency, but with a more stable and slowly progressive clinical phenotype. And so that may uh, correspond to a lot of different situations, but one of those is a case where you have a stable dystrophin expression, but only part of the dystrophin molecule. So in the case of, say, a large deletion within the dystrophin gene, but it actually still produces a shortened dystrophin, um, you will have evidence of um, positive expression of some dystrophin, uh, some portions of dystrophin, and negative uh, ability to detect other portions of dystrophin. And so this is what you can see in a subset of Becker muscular dystrophy patients. Uh, it's also um, what you can see in uh, therapeutic uh, microdystrophin um, expression, for instance. Okay, so 
with that bit of background, uh, let's talk about what Cure Rare Disease asked us to do. So they had seven patient samples on which um, I wasn't really given any kind of information. These patients wanted to have their, um, their dystrophin uh, expression assessed. And so the things that our laboratory does uh, most often is immunostaining like I just showed you. So the staining of the slides with antibodies um, to look for dystrophin expression. And then the other technique is Western blot. And that's a more quantitative uh, way of looking at it to say you have this percentage of dystrophin versus where it is and where it is not. And between those two approaches, that can be really useful in determining the level of dystrophin deficiency. And if you have a positive signal, where is that signal and what is the nature of it? Um, and so this is a a component of a lot of the current clinical trial uh, assessments that are being done in, um, in DMD. And so uh, in doing the immunostaining analysis, so this is the immuno, immunostaining basically can, uh, can be divided into immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence. Immunohistochemistry tends to talk about like using brown or red on a, a bright field microscopy. So that's what I was just showing you. Uh, immunofluorescence tends to have a black background and they use fluorescent indicators uh, to, um, uh, to see the signal as say bright green or uh, bright red. And that's what I'll be showing you um, in a few minutes. You may see either of these approaches used. Usually for clinical purposes, they use that uh, bright field immunohistochemistry because then you can just use your desk microscope that most pathologists have in their office and then make the assessment and then they're done. And there's not really a need to kind of look at multiple proteins at once. Immunofluorescence allows you to um, answer different types of questions. And so it uses the same technology just with a different indicator, but the idea is that with fluorescence you can, you can use one antibody, for instance, to make something you know, fluoresce green, another antibody to make something fluoresce red, and then you can take pictures in a way that overlaps uh, the signals so that you can see the degree of overlap. And so that's what you're going to end up seeing in a lot of scientific publications and presentations because uh, it's a way to, um, you know, to be able to answer more questions about how things are associated. There's also the ability to look a little bit at immunofluorescence brightness as a uh, component to how much uh, protein is there, but that needs to be done really, really carefully um, in order to be done correctly. So um, in any case, what I was asked to do is to do this immunofluorescence testing uh, on uh, seven different muscles patient samples, uh, and that uh, we were comparing them to known positive samples that, that express dystrophin that we had. And, um, and just looking at the percentage of area that we thought was positive. And in doing this sort of thing, um, you know, it requires the use of antibodies. And so antibodies are things that are produced by the immune system, They're usually used to, uh, in, in your body to bind to, for instance, foreign proteins, things around bacteria, viruses, things like that. Uh, and that allows these things to be kind of neutralized and cleaned up and, and degraded. Uh, for the past couple of decades, there has been an increasing use of antibodies as tools for scientific discovery. The idea um, kind of on the basic level is to design antibodies around a specific protein that you want to detect and then to design a variety of ways to uh, demonstrate where it is and where it's not. And so what typically happens is that you'll, you'll take a sample, you'll have a way to kind of um, you know, expose your sample to the antibodies. You'll treat with the antibodies, you'll wash that off. You'll treat with something that allows you to detect it, you'll wash that off, and you'll try to visualize it. And so both immunohistochemistry and Western blot fit into these kind of categories of techniques. And so for immunohistochemistry, um, for instance, you'll have an anti-dystrophin antibody this antigen is what it binds to, so it'll be dystrophin on the surface of the cells. Your anti-dystrophin antibody will uh, bind to it, and then there is a labeled secondary antibody. And if this labeled secondary antibody is, um, for instance, uh, you know, uh, well, if it's complexed to something 
that allows a chemical substrate to be uh, to produce a brown color, what you're going to have is this bright field picture with this brown signal on immunohistochemistry. On immunofluorescence, you'd have a secondary antibody that's basically conjugated to something that uh, takes light at a certain wavelength and then uh, fluoresces at a different wavelength, and that's the, the basis for immunofluorescence. And so the idea here is that your specificity of what you're trying to detect happens with your primary antibody, and the signal that you're trying to read comes with the secondary antibody. And this is all done directly on a slide. For Western blot, it's a little bit different. And so you have your protein isolate, you kind of grind it up and you isolate the proteins from the tissue, and then you run it out on a gel. And so this gel is going to run out the proteins from heavy to light. And so this is like a gel where an electrical field is pushing the proteins through and the percentage of the gel, um, at least in the ones that we use, decreases as it gets lower. And so the idea here is that you've got, um, even in, you know, in any of these gels, the biggest proteins are going to have the hardest time moving through the gel as they're being pushed by an electrical field. The smallest proteins are going to move the fastest. And so then you have the ability to look in each lane where you've put a given protein sample and the heavy things will be up here and then it gets lighter, 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 lighter. Okay. And so you have a, a big ladder of proteins that's separated out by Western blot. Uh, then this is transferred to a membrane that allows you to probe it with the antibodies. And so again, you'd use a primary antibody for uh, that might detect dystrophin or it might detect microdystrophin or both. Uh, or gap DH, as we'll talk about, uh, you know, as one one example of a loading control that you could do, uh, which would be a different antibody. Uh, but the idea here is that you would expose this membrane to an antibody, and then again do this primary and secondary antibody to recognize it. And so while there's lots and lots of proteins that are present on the membrane in each of these lanes. The things that we're visualizing here are the band that corresponds to where the antibody bound. And then by having that as associated with your sample and then having some sort of element uh, to quantify things. So in this case, this is a full length dystrophin quantification curve to see what the signal is for 100% dystrophin, 50% dystrophin, 25, 10, 0 on this blot you can determine what a given darkness of band here corresponds to as a percentage of dystrophin. And so that's one way to quantify um, the amount of protein you've got here. And so as you think about immunohistochemistry, this is showing you where the protein is or is not. And uh, the molecular, uh, and for Western blot, it's going to tell you a little bit about how large that protein you're detecting is and, um, and the amount of it. And so in looking at these seven samples, um, we didn't know anything about their mutation types or the treatment status or anything like that. And so um, we just chose a variety of different antibodies um, that would bind within dystrophin. And so you can see here, so this is a, a map of the dystrophin, um, you know, of the dystrophin gene essentially. And um, what you can see here is that there are many different exons that are uh, portions of the protein that are expressed. These all will be different little chunks of protein that, of you know, sequences of amino acid, for instance, that are an element of the protein that an antibody might be able to see. But dystrophin is so large that there are a lot of different places that could be recognized. And in the presence of, uh, for instance, a shortened dystrophin, there may be some antibodies that don't recognize it that, um, you know, because that portion of the protein isn't there. And so one of the, um, strategies you can use to assess more broadly whether or not you've got dystrophin deficiency or specific components of dystrophin deficiency is to have a battery of antibodies that you um, that you test a, a sample with. And so what you can see here, there are a number of antibodies that we tested um, the samples with and the spot on the dystrophin molecule where they bound is just labeled here um, to show that we had a pretty decent coverage of different parts of the dystrophin molecule. And when we did uh, bioimmunofluorescence, when we looked at the uh, samples that we had, we had a couple of different patterns that we noted. And so I'm just going to, um, it's written out here, but I'm gonna describe them. 
So first of all, the positive control pattern. So this is what it looks like normally. Okay, you can see that there are some greens and there are some reds uh, here using different antibodies um, and different combinations of antibodies. And in normal muscle, you can see just like in the immunohistochemistry images earlier, you've got um, good positive staining at around the edges of each of the muscle fibers. So you can see the muscle fiber edges very clearly. There's good signal on the green, there's good signal on the red. And as I mentioned earlier, when you're doing this by immunofluorescence and you overlay them, the green and the red together gives you a good yellow signal that, that looks like that rather than patches of green or red um, in different areas. Another uh, pattern that we observed here um, was what we call a revertin fiber pattern. So revertin fibers are what people call uh, essentially fibers that are still positive even when you have essentially no dystrophin. And so there's an, um, you know, in, in DMD, there's often up to about 5% uh, of fibers uh, that will still express dystrophin protein in certain areas. And so you'll look at a section and it'll be almost entirely devoid of dystrophin positivity. And yet you may see scattered uh, positive fibers or clusters. And these are just fibers that are somehow managing to read through what the primary mutation is and still produce a bit of uh, functional dystrophin. And so what you can see here is that you've got um, some fibers that are um, are detectable across multiple different antibodies um, to various extents, but um, it's the same little patch. And really, it's just this little patch and across probably a, a sample that has 10,000 muscle fibers in it. And so it's not necessarily rescuing function to any great extent. It's a very, very small number of fibers, um, but it is detectable. And then we had another uh, type of um, reactivity, which is an interesting one. And this is, we have positivity, uh, clear positivity with a subset of uh, antibodies, and then we have clear negativity with another subset of antibodies. And so um, this was seen in one, uh, in one sample and it is consistent with a shortened dystrophin. And so that could either be a Becker muscular dystrophy patient that had lost uh, a portion of the dystrophin uh, gene, uh, but that it was done in a way that was stable enough to produce a stable protein for the rest of the dystrophin. The other um, way uh, that this could occur is that this is a uh, patient who had been treated with a microdystrophin agent. And what we're detecting here is the microdystrophin. Um, and so uh, I've seen uh, this sort of pattern in association with microdystrophin studies because I work in solids trial, but this isn't uh, what their microdystrophin looks like because I, I know what antibodies that binds to, uh, and some of them are negative here. So uh, from my perspective, I can't tell uh, whether or not this is a patient with that's been treated or this is a result of the mutation, but this is what the kind of thing that you would see with a shortened dystrophin. And uh, as you'll see, we also see this on the Western blot as a, as a, uh, a pretty defined shortened dystrophin band uh, for this patient. Okay. And then really, this is kind of a busy slide. This is just to provide an example of the fact that evaluating these sometimes isn't straightforward. And so you can see here, there's a variety of ways to look at the results. But when you look at my notes uh, around certain specimens and certain antibodies, you can see that uh, with some antibodies, some samples have a really high background and are actually pretty hard um, to quantify. And so while the examples that I'm providing you with are really like, oh, they're black or they're glowing in the dark, um, when you have something that's actually very low in intensity, but you can still see something, sometimes it's a bit difficult to um, say, okay, well, I can see everything at the same intensity, but is it really low? Or is it a normal sample, for instance, or normal expression level, but that the sample just isn't very bright? Um, and so that can be confusing and it can be helpful for, you know, as you can see, to look at what the relative positivity is 
uh, is across um, other antibodies and even across other assays. Um, and, and this is something that happens in uh, working with patients, especially, is that there are just some patients that have a high level of background that makes the uh, histology scoring harder and, um, and many patients that don't. And it's you know just something you kind of get used to. In this case, since we were also doing the Western blotting, it also helped to understand whether or not this high background was true positivity versus background, uh, because the, if it was true positivity, it would show up on the Western blot, and if it was background, uh, it would not. And so the, these uh, samples here that I was worried about being potentially large proportions of positive expression uh, or background uh, were are going to show up as clearly negative on the Western blot. And so it's clear that it's a, that's like a signal to noise issue uh, when using these samples. So the other side of the um, analysis was the Western blot. We did four different antibodies on Western blot. Um, you know, there are, there's a little bit of technical optimization associated with some of this. Um, one is, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, you you make a control curve based on um, what normal is. And so um, cure rare disease had to identify or had to obtain some things that we could screen to say, okay, well, we think that this is going to be what normal levels of dystrophin expression are um, to create our, um, our control curve. And uh, so there was a, a set of assessing that. And then again, we did a bunch of different Western blots to assess uh, positivity and the performance of, um, of each of these antibodies on the patient samples. And then there's a component of it that's looking at whether or not the loading, for instance, was done correctly, um, which I'll, I'll also go through. And so for the, the first experiment for this really was just looking at uh, five um, muscle samples that were supposedly normal muscle samples that were obtained from a tissue uh, repository called CureLine. And so we looked, loaded these samples in the different lanes of the, of the Western blot, uh, and then we probed them with three different animals. And as you can see here, here are a bunch of the different antibodies. Um, you you have each of these different anti-dystrophin antibodies. This is the top portion of the gel of the membrane, basically that would include uh, dystrophin. You can see each sample has a different level of intensity. This third one seems to be lower in intensity than the others. Um, and then the bottom portion of the membrane, we actually cut off and we probe with beta tubulin. This is just to ensure that nobody had made any mistakes in loading. So for instance, that the sample that is lower is not lower because less protein got loaded into the well or something spilled out, but that, that there's actually less protein in, in the same um, amount of isolated protein in that particular sample. And so you'll see these beta tubulin loading controls give an element of, positive, uh, of quality control related to that. And these quality control measures are really important to ensuring that uh, the, um, you know, the study is, is being performed appropriately. And when we look at uh, the performance of each of these samples, um, you know, we were most concerned about the third one. The other ones performed within acceptable uh, ranges for us. And so we said, okay, going forward for a formal test, we'll get rid of that, that uh, poorly performing human muscle sample. The other four are good. And then as a representation of uh, what is normal, um, we uh, will isolate across all four of those samples and pool them together and then say, this is an indicator of what's normal across multiple patients. And that's, that's what's going to be considered 100% in the uh, study forward. And so um, now that we have a means of showing what normal is, um, we know that these are samples that are expected to be pretty low in terms of their positivity. And so we made a control curve that spanned from 0% to 30% uh, normal dystrophin. We um, diluted out these normal samples with um, mouse, with, with MDX mouse dystrophin. Um, and 
in the, you know, so that, for instance, the 30% sample had 30% of our mixture of normal human tissue, 70% of protein from uh, dystrophin deficient mice, and, um, and then each of these items provides the control curve for quantification. And then we have uh, a series of these patient samples and then a couple of blank wells. And then this map was used across four different antibodies uh, that were done in four different blots. So we're looking at uh, MANDIS 106. You can see here we've got really clear ability to distinguish between 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30 percent dystrophin, and really no appreciable uh, bands out in the patient samples. So that looks essentially negative. Loading control for this looked really excellent. In contrast, when we look at DISP-B, again you have the loading control, and then at the molecular weight where you're expecting full-length dystrophin, you're really not detecting anything. And then again, like we saw in the immunostaining, and including immunostaining with DISP-B, you have this one patient that has what looks like a pretty stable, uh, much smaller dystrophin. And so that's, um, that's often what microdystrophin looks like, although you can't tell which microdystrophin it is. Um, unless you know more about how they're constructed and how much they're supposed to weigh. Loading control again. That was good. And then disk one. Again, you've got a good control curve and then no detection of um, the shortened dystrophin or a full length dystrophin. And so, uh, and then for the, for the fourth, it didn't uh, perform very well on Western blot. It was one that we hadn't really used before uh, for that, and so it's not worth really showing. Um, the, in terms of the conclusions we were able to make, we had one sample that had a 6% um, shortened dystrophin, which I'm calling microdystrophin here, uh, because it's uh, uncommon really to see something that sharp in a, a Becker patient. Uh, so that's a patient that had something that was smaller um, than normal dystrophin, and it was only expressing certain dystrophin epitopes and not others. Um, and then there were a variety of uh, quality control assessments we were able to provide, but in general, everybody had, everybody had uh, essentially undetectable or very, very, very low um, full-length dystrophin, which would be expected for, um, for DMD patients. And so overall, uh, take home message just for this, hopefully, <laughs> are uh, that there are some really good and well-established techniques available for looking at uh, where dystrophin or another protein might be and then how much is there. Uh, and immunostaining and Western blots are things that, that people commonly use. Um, these use antibodies to detect specific portions of dystrophin, and you can run experiments to leverage the differences between different antibodies and constructs to help uh, answer scientific questions. There are methods that don't require antibodies for dystrophin quantitation, uh, and, and many people use those as well, uh, but this is just happens to be the things that we're most comfortable with. Uh, patients with DMD often have undetectable or barely detectable expression of the dystrophin protein. We talked a little bit about revertin fibers, uh, and it's not uncommon to have very, very, very low levels of uh, dystrophin expression, often, you know, under 1%. Um, if you do a Western blot that's really sensitive for dystrophin expression in an untreated DMD patient. Um, and that, you know, really as as treatments are getting developed, there's been a lot of work done into how to appropriately uh, assess dystrophin quantification uh, and um, you know, how much is there and where it is and everything, because this is a really important thing that is involved in uh, proving whether or not uh, new therapies are efficacious for DMD. And uh, so I want to thank Rich Horgan, who funded uh, this small project. And this is just a, um, a picture of the lab and the many wonderful people that work on this sort of thing. Um, so.
Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope this was informative.